It is true. And I do believe that that day will be like that. And I'm sure we'll be surprised as well. It's greater than what we are written about. When we see that in Revelation, I just know that day is coming, coming soon. So we started um, a few months ago to do something on our own, sometimes in groups or in pairs, to read through the Bible. In all of the things that we're doing in this world, there are a few things that are common that can always be reliable and necessary for a Christian. So we don't have to sing a certain way or dance a certain way, but there are some things that we really do need to do on a regular basis, and that's to listen to the voice of God. The voice of God has given to us in the Scripture. So we decided that we're going to go through the Bible, reading it in three years. So we're probably about five or six books in already. If you want to join up in this endeavor, please just start now. It doesn't, you don't have to go and do any homework or anything else. You need to just start. So We've gone through um, the book of Luke. We've done Judges. That was a struggle. Those stories are a little terrifying sometimes. We did Leviticus, and some of you actually finished it. And now we're ready to embark on the book of 1 Corinthians. So if you want to have a book of Corinthians, and it has some room on the side of the text for notes or things like that. It's in the back or in the front desk there. You can pick up on your way, and let's start reading the book of 1 Corinthians. And (laughs) we're going to focus our month on one verse, almost. Are you ready? Well, I'm thinking about a quiz. What about you? Are you ready for a a church quiz? All right. (laughs) Leo is ready. He does quizzes well, don't you? All right. We're doing a quiz on church truth. Things that are real and true in life. So here it goes. Um, We're thinking about the Corinthians And that church that Paul was written a couple letters to, but we're going to focus on the Corinthians and we'll think about this. Uh, Question number one, the first century churches were free from cliques, conflict, and quarrels. Right? No, think about it. Don't be so quick, right? All right. True or false? For First century churches were completely free from cliques and conflict and quarrels. Of course, they're so close to people and the disciples and apostles that clearly they would never function that way, right? All right. Number two. If Paul started a new church in Wenatchee or any other place because it's Paul you could be confident that the believers would be committed to their marriages, unity, and a high standard of morality. Right? Uh, Paul. Number three on the quiz. Since the early church believers were taught by Paul, the great apostle, the sound biblical teaching would be sufficient to defend the church from hypocrisy, selfishness, and corruption. Clearly. True or false? False. Number four. Much like in the early church and today, of course, it's always like this. Enduring love always simply just flows freely into the lives of believers. It's so easy. 
true or false? Does love just flow freely from any believer easily? Hmm, what about number five? Affluent people tend to be generous people. Or another way to say, a wealthy church is a healthy, giving, gracious church. Is that true or false? How did you do with your quiz? Hmm, 100%, right? Well, it's probably an easy quiz, isn't it? It's not easy to look at our heroes in churches in the Bible and see them being so imperfect. If you were to read from beginning to end in the book of Corinthians, I would be very curious to see some of your thoughts. So let's do it this weekend. Just go all the way through it. Pick it up and go through it. But I would love to hear some of your thoughts about the book of of Corinthians. But I want to go back a little bit in time and do a little bit of a mapping in church right now. We want to go back to Paul's missionary travel, the trip itinerary, right? So I'll go through a couple of them. There's none on the, um, the slides right now, but if you want to start back, when you think about the beginning of the um, the church of Corinthians, that place in Corinth, it starts back in Acts chapter 16. Now in Acts 16, it says that they went to the border of Mysia. They tried to enter in through Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to go. So they passed through Mishia, and they went to a place called Troas, and they went down there, and that's where Paul got this massive vision, this beautiful um, dream from a man that says, I want you to go and preach to Macedonia, to go into that place in Macedonia where those Greeks are, those people, the, like the city of immorality, that area. So Paul, pick it up again in Acts chapter 17. You'll see Paul goes in with his um, command, um, com all of his friends, all the other disciples of Jesus, that they went through, and they went through Ampolis, Apollonia, Thessalonica. They went through uh, places like there where they had Jewish synagogues there. So there were some people who were believers. But through all of that, they spent three weeks in that area. And after Paul's preaching with a bunch of believers, what happened? Half of them split. And they started a riot. That's right. Because the preacher didn't like what you were saying, they decided the other side over here, you decided to start riot. And this is true. If you're going to have a riot in this church, it's going to start over here on this side. All the rebels are over there. The saints. <laughs> I'm starting to cause a riot, aren't I? Well, hold on here. I was just kidding. They went from that place of that riot, they went through Athens and then right there, it's a totally different group in Athens. They started to talk and preach, and they walked into that area. Paul goes in there, and this is the place where everybody goes to talk about things. And it doesn't matter what they are. It's a bunch of philosophers who love, in the middle of the day, some people like to golf, some play pickleball, some people do art, they do walks, they go around and sit at the coffee shops. You know what they did? They sat down in the stadium and they listened to other people and they critique each other's philosophies. That doesn't sound like it's very exciting, but that's what they did. And that was their culture. And it's almost like this is that place where they have TED Talks all day long. And people would go and check out who's the new thing. And then all of that, Paul walked in the middle of that era, 
and they spoke. And he says, I have something to add to this. I see you have a God over here. It's called the unknown God. I'm going to introduce you to the unknown God. So, was there a riot? No, really sophisticated people who like to talk all the time, they don't have like a, a riot or anything like that. That's for people who are rural people, right? They fight. Oh, in our cities, we don't do that. We just, if we don't like it, they do this. They sneer. Do you know what a sneer is? I'll show you a sneer. And sometimes you hold up your hands and you go, I don't believe you. I think you're wrong. I think you're not very wise. Not as much as you think you are. So that's the sneer. I've been working on my sneer. It doesn't really feel good to sneer, but that was their thing. And so out of that, there was a group of people. Some of the people who did not sneer, they actually embraced this gospel. A small group. And they went into Corinth with Paul. And it says here in Acts 18, read what happened here after this trip. This trip went up and down, around through city after city after city. And they stopped at this place and he found a few people. He started a church. And it says that he met a, a name, Aquila, a native of Pontius, who had rec recently came from Italy with his his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all of the Jews to leave Rome. So everybody in that area left. And so Paul went to see them. And because he was a what? A tent maker, as they were, he stayed and did what? He worked with them. So Paul didn't just go out there and start speaking on a circuit. After a while, people weren't listening to the preacher anymore, so he had to start gardening, or selling things, or making smoothies, or something. You have to have a skill, I say to all of our young people, no matter what you're going to be trained to do, get another skill just in case, right? I'm pretty good at smoothies. Just... So you know. But this is what happened. They stayed with him and every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue. So one day he would go out there to preach and talk and have a Bible study. But they pers persuade the Greeks and the Jews into like a small church. This church, this group of people in the city of Corinth started to become a whole area of believers. What a journey it was in Corinth. And I'm thinking about what kind of style that he did. Why did he change? He went all the way down with these public speaking moments, but then he came in here and he did something totally different. He decided to immerse himself into that community and then he started to change his tone. Go read of his letters to people and those moments where he starts preaching. He's on fire. But he changed his tone, his approach, his whole attitude. So we, before we go in, into Corinthians, take a look what Paul says about his style. 1 Corinthians Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says this. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved. He made a decision. He made an adjustment. A moment in his, his whole career of being a professor, he 
changes his tone and he says, I resolve to know nothing while I was with you except what? Jesus Christ and what? The cross became the theme of everything that Paul would teach about. And don't you think if you were to focus on the cross and the resurrection would completely change all of the believers automatically. False. It doesn't always work that way. But that was his jam. That was his stick. That was his approach. And his attitude and his topic, his content was there. He says, I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. When he came into Corinthians, into that area, he was out of his depth. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words and ideas. I did it this way, why? So that you, that your faith might not rest on what? human wisdom, but on God's power. That's why we read the scriptures on our own. God's power will empower you and us as a church, as individuals. It's not going to come through here, through there, or there, or this. It's going to go through you. (laughs) And yet, with all of this, The church of Corinthians was filled with like, I don't know, filled with knots. It was a mess at this church. The church of Corinthians, they had this nature of wisdom that they're tripping over their clever ideas. The meaning of the cross that got twisted. And although they were a fast-growing church, they had several of them in Corinthians, They were petty, and they were fighting. They had shameful acts at church. Marital problems abound. Confusion at the Lord's table. They were making this thing a mess. They're making this as a banquet for some people, and it's poverty for others. It was terrible, the Lord's table. They had, they had divisions, and they would be like they would brag about their divisions. They were smart, but they couldn't stop arguing. And it wasn't just arguing; it was like split. You know what I say when we split hairs? This idea where whatever it is, this nuance is we divided even more. I'm so glad that we don't do that today. False. Spiritual gifts were such a big part of this group. Spiritual gifts became a a rank and tenure thing. Some people have some gifts and others have others. They were higher or better. This is exciting. And it just, this church reminds me of a junk drawer. Do you know what I'm saying uh, of a junk drawer? I know you have a junk drawer. Do you know what I'm saying? It's all the stuff that you get that you think is going to be important. And because you don't have the discipline to put things in the right place, what are you going to do? I'm sorry, that's my thing. Maybe you're really organized, but you put everything in this junk drawer. You have this in yours, like for paint, for anything that's going to scratch. Everybody has to have a level. Whether you can actually use that tool or not, you got to have that. Do you have all of this? You have to have some glue in there because something's going to break and you're going to fix it right now. Oh, how many wipes are in my junk drawer? They're splittered around in there everywhere. 
You always have to have a permanent marker, right, for something. Got to have some tools, right? Definitely. Chad says, yes, I have more. Who has that? Rubber bands, tape, dog hair remover, clips that you don't even know how to start when one side or the other. A stapler. How many of you go and staple things in your kitchen? You have that because it's just like a part of your museum of junk drawers. Does anyone use a pencil anymore? No, but you'll have a sharper in there. And you have those things to put on your furniture to make your place note. This is the junk drawer. It looks like that. Some of you have this kind of a junk drawer, though. You think you're so much more spiritual. Look at the next one there. We have this one. Oh, so organized. The same thing. I cannot believe the junk drawer. And I am in so much trouble right now. In my house, we don't have a junk drawer anymore. However, in the garage, which is my area, my wife has nine junk drawers. And so I, I shot myself in the foot by saying, no junk drawers in our kitchen. It's a mess and we don't use it. Just put your stuff away. She did. Nine junk drawers in the garage. I cannot put anything away in the garage because it's in their junk drawers. I'm not a smart man is what I'm saying. So what do you do to make your junk drawer even worse? This is Corinth. Somebody put some string or thread in your junk drawer and you moved it around and all you need to do is move it around one time, right? And everything in that junk drawer is connected by that thread or that rubber band or that little cord in there. And you pull out a pen and you pull everything out. That's Corinth. That's the church of Corinth. This tangled mess of all this valuable thing. And it's all there. So, this is why Paul, when you read the book of Corinthians, right at the most important part of this book, Paul centers everything in the book into one verse. His remedy for this mess that they have in this church, Paul says, I have one thing that we can do. It's not going into the junk drawer and cutting up all the things and try to divide it in. They tried to do that. They tried to untangle things. They tried to organize things. That's not the answer. He says, don't look at the junk drawer. He starts by doing this. He says, we need to simplify. He returns the church to three things. Faith, hope, and love. Now, some of you says, well, wait a minute. You mean we're not going to fight about theology again? Like, we're not going to have our, our, our little arguments? Well, that's not church for me. Some of you say, well, wait a minute. Are you going to, are you going to, are you just going to start loving people who are not always kind to others? I know exactly who they are in the church. Are we going to do that? Uh, I'm not sure if that's appropriate. (laughs) Paul says, we're going to simplify things. It says in Corinthians 13, verse 13, now these three remain. Hope, Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So today, just a bit of a refresher on the first of the three of these three weeks. Of course, I had to do hope. I waited to do this so that we could do hope 
on the same weekend, we'd have Mother's Weekend. Don't you think that's appropriate? Finish it with love in three weeks. But we'll start with faith and do a bit of a refresher of faith. Today, if we're going to simplify our messy life by focusing on faith, we need to understand that there's a couple different ways to describe or define faith. So faith is also, and we're not talking about that in, entirely here, but when we talk about a person who have a sense of faith, or a, a, a body of belief, your fundamental beliefs, or uh, articles of faith, we call it, this is our firm what? Foundation. Our faith. So I'm going to hold on to my what? My faith, it's usually, it's a body of truth that you embrace. Is that part of it? Yes. That's one way to say the word faith. But there is another way to say that. Faith is not something that you embrace and say it is a body of um, doctrines or truth, something that you embrace. Faith is something that you do. It is an active trust into something else. So there's also two parts of that, too. So, so take that second part that we're talking about, the active faith. The things that we do. It's a verb, right? And there's a couple parts of that that you break that down a little bit. First of all, let's talk about two words. The first one is belief. The second part is commitment. The first thing is belief first, though. This is what happens in your brain. You believe from where? From your heart? Your heart is pumping things right now. It's like a, an engine that's moving blood. Your brain. That's where you find your sense of belief. You can't choose to believe something. Think about this. When we tell people to... Don't get mad when you're mad. Or don't be afraid when you're terrified. Does, does that work? Or don't worry. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad you asked that. That's helpful. Does that work? It doesn't work like that. Some of you say, yeah, I, don't, I, hate, I hate when people do that with me. It's the same thing with belief. A belief is not something that you commit to and say, I choose to believe this. A belief is something that's a byproduct of some things that happen already. Thoughts that you have thought about and things that you experience. Things that you think about, that is true, but then things that you have done. I'll tell you. It's the same thing if you're jumping out of an airplane, right? Do I believe that I'm going to live? Well, initially, maybe you'll have some 50-50 stuff with that, right? Like, I don't know if this is going to work. You do it two or three times, you have what we sense of belief. You have the, the experience. So this grows like a muscle, okay? So you don't have to have 100% certainty before you can have a belief. We do it all the time. If anyone gets married, you know you're not 100%. And those people who tell me that they've never had any doubts or anything like that, you're out of your mind. Or you're just one of those people who are not thinking through. If you look at the other person, you go there and say, this is a human. So it's really important you can actually believe something, and you can still have a few doubts. Happens all the time. I have a great car. I love it. Turns on, and it starts up. Even if it's made in the 80s, this car, you crank it on. But there's a couple times it didn't turn on. So when I turn on... The engine, what, what do I think? Like, I have to think a little bit. Most of the time, I just do it. But sometimes, mm, 
what's going to think? So you have that concept. Even though you have a sense of belief that's not entirely certain, did in the same group here, it's a part of being a human. Belief doesn't have to have 100%. However, the commitment part, it's all in or nothing. <laughs> when you go to the table, right, or the altar at the, um, for the wedding, and you go up there and to do your vows, and you say, well, you know, I'm like 95% sure about this person, right? 95% when you do the vows, they say, do you take this person? Da, da, da. And, and at the end of that, you could say, well, I do, mostly. What? Mostly? Yeah, almost. Yeah, almost. Yeah, do you... Do you take this person? I do. Like, like 95%. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. You have a 100% commitment. And the same thing when you're jumping out, you don't partially jump out. You jump. That's why we call a leap of what? It requires a commitment. What happens with these two things, belief your thought says that this is possible and true, and then you act on this. This is your commitment. You create what? A sense of faith. This is like a muscle that you develop. And if you don't develop exercise and work out that muscle, what's going to happen? It's still there. It's dormant. It's lame. It's weak. And this is what we see in a church like this. So, I think about this chair. And I'm trying to talk about this chair as being a very reliable, a great support. Especially when I'm really tired, this chair is going to give me relief. Rest. Now I can talk all I want about this chair. And I can describe the construction, the color, how the style is perfect for me. The size, the length, everything. But I don't really have faith until what? Until I sit down into the chair. And every time you do it, you think about what happens. There is a moment where you put all of your weight. That's the commitment where you put all of your weight onto the chair. What happens if someone in your classroom decides to pull it as you're falling down? That means every time you go to a chair for the next four years in elementary school, you look around and you hold on to it. You're where Johnny is and where's Leo? He's over there. Okay. And you do that for four years. Maybe that was just my experience, but my trauma. But when you completely put your body, heart, and life on this, and this is what we call faith. Is it a perfect moment? No. I can wobble. I can struggle. I can fall in faith. In so many different ways that's so imperfect. It's not really about a perfect way to do it. It's did you put all of your weight on something? I'll tell you, I became a believer when I was an, a young person. And through high school, I don't even remember high school much. 
I just remember faith became very real to me when I had to do things on my own. My dad taught me to be a hard worker, to have initiative, to solve my problems. And probably the greatest, you know, gift he gave is the ability to be reliable. So I was a good worker. I decided to go to college. I took a whole year out. I had no scholarships. I had no money saved. And I came to a place where I had to go to college and get a job. And my job, it, it wouldn't work. There's no job. So I got in, but I didn't have enough to pay for college. Family was doing things that they had to do. I was kind of on my own in that moment. So I was looking for a good job. I was in my dorm room, and somebody made a comment and said, so do, you don't even have enough. I was packing up my stuff and going home. I was going to quit. And then one of the young students said to me, he says, are you just going to bail? I thought you used to have faith. And this is a person who's not even a believer. Like, this is a person who's just like a sarcastic person. So I went down to the paper and I went in my dorm room. And I found an interview, interview to go to a place. I got an interview and I came up the hill. And I thought, wow, this is a mansion. God is good. My faith went what? Because I knew that if I exercised and get this interview, that definitely God just opened the doors for me, right? So I went up the whole time. I went, I drove up to the front of this place, and I put my old 1980s pickup truck right between a great, there was a red Porsche, and sorry, and then a a limousine, and I gave a lot of room so that I can open my doors and not, you know, scratch my pickup truck. Um, so I go up there, and I'm sitting there waiting in this foyer. It's, it's marble inside. And I'm thinking the whole time, I'm almost singing songs like, God is good, and now I'm rich. I have a great job. Thank you, God. And at that moment... One of my friends, his name is Alan, Alan Starbird, comes out of the back of this room with the owner of this house. And his, like the owner had his hand on his shoulder like it's his son. And he says, I'll see you on Monday. Thank you for having you part of our team. One of my friends got the job. That's pretty sick, to have God that would move me to the place where I can commit, believe, and then try, and then what's going to happen? Just to slap, the, slap me in my face. So I'm sitting there. Alad walked right by me and didn't look at me because, well, I can take him. And, and also... He is a better person with horses. And so I'm sitting there, devastated. And the man says, I'm so sorry. He says, I'm just going to hire Alan. I'm, that's not very professional, but I'm sorry. And I says, well, thank you. Um, and when I went to that big door, it was a moment where I had to do something that I'd never done. I never ask. But I wanted to go to school. And I know I could work. So I said something that I've never thought to do. I said, Lord, I'll just try it. I turned around and looked at him and I said, do you have anything else for a job? I'm in college and I need a job. That was humiliating for me. He says, well, yeah, but you'd need to actually need to live here. <laughs> well, 
show me the place. <laughs> so let me show you the place here. He told me about what he needed. He needs somebody who can train with him. I'm an athlete. I know how to train people. So he says, I run five miles a day. Can you run with me? Because I won't do it unless I have somebody else will do it. And then, are you willing to be trained as a cook or a chef? Sure. And then he says, you have to take care of all of our guests. Some of our guests are very dishonest, unkind, and some of them are very immoral. Can you be true, honest, and faithful to me and this place? Because we don't have a lot of junk that's going on in this place. It needs to be pristine. And he says, can you clean? I said, I know how to clean. I had to clean this whole 30,000 square foot mansion. That was my job. So I was like a butler, <laughs> a trainer, a manager, a social worker, a counselor. And I worked. Is that my answer? No. Halfway through this, it got really hard. We had movie stores movies, um, stars, and politicians, and I've cooked like food for people who are country western people that are very popular. Loretta Lynn, chicken with this green stuff on there. Yeah, I did it all, and it was great, but after a while I couldn't still make my bills. I was working full-time and working full-time. Does that work? It had to. And I got to a place where it's just not going to work. And I said to the person, I says, look, this has been a great job. I really appreciate it, but I need to take a, wake, a break and figure out how to do this. And he said to me, he says, I want you to think about it for one more week. Work hard, be faithful, be honest, like I said, and if you say the same thing, then that's fine. Otherwise, I'll have to do something different. A week later, I didn't change my mind, but I was thinking and ruminating on this thing and was looking back at how my family negotiated through trials and tribulations. And every time up to this point, I just looked about how many times God just moves me to the next step. Does God fix everything in your future? Faith does not work that way. It helps you through the next step. I went in there, and I said, I just talked to the school, um, sir, and, and I'm going to be in debt. So I, I need to, to do something else unless you have another option. He pulls out an envelope. And he says, this is your other option. And I said, what's the option? He says, I'm cutting your wages. This is your option. So when somebody is going to cut your wages, that's going the wrong direction, isn't it? But I reached the envelope and I says, and he said, do you trust me? I says, yes. I opened up the envelope. My school, my school bill was paid for the whole year. And he says, now, on your $40 a week, you got to figure out how to do your life right. To be honest, to be true, and to be faithful to this place. To your studies are... The number one thing for you, but the number thing that you do is you are here for us. Did it for another year. And in all of this, it wasn't the end of the problems. But I got through four years of college into three years working full time. That doesn't happen anymore. I'm not that smart. 
and I don't work that efficiently either. That was because at the end of that road, every time, I believed that God was going to be faithful. All I had to do was step over and do it. To sit down into the chair and commit. And as you do that at the end of the day, didn't have any debt out of college, which is weird. I'm just saying today, it's no different. The faith that requires every believer to trust that this is going to be your ticket home, that a Savior is going to make a way for you into eternal life, that's a faith moment. You have to say yes to this. It's not just here, but you have to trust that today, if the Lord were to come through this clouds of glory, am I smart enough to make myself Like a way into heaven? No. I'm just not. I'm a failure. I have to trust this. Paul was trying to teach the Corinthians that this is your only way. But now that trust in Christ on the cross needs to be fleshed out in every decision that you make. When you have a moment where you have an obstacle, it doesn't have to be a wall. It can just be a speed bump with our God. Just needs a little gas and a little bit of commitment. And we'll be there. Hmm. Paul would finish the whole book or the letter to Corinthians with this verse. He would use, I use the sitting metaphor, but I'll show you this one in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. It says this. What? If you're going to simplify your life, okay, it's all about the first part is what? Be on guard. This is going to be a war, (laughs) right? Stand firm in what? In faith. Be courageous. Be strong. So I'm going to ask a couple questions here. Kind of a different quiz. (laughs) Before you commit to whatever your obstacles are in your life, take a, a refresher course. It says... Ask yourself a few questions. What have you learned about God in your life? Write it down on a piece of paper. What are some things that you have learned already about life? John Heisey, I know you can write a book, can't you? What have you learned? What do you think might be true? What do you really believe? What do you know and what has happened to you? And how is it possible that you're in this place instead of somewhere else on a Sabbath afternoon? You're here for a reason. Something has happened. That's your belief. It's experienced. You didn't walk away from your commitments, your problems, and your struggles. You decided, no, I'm going to fight. I'm going to argue. I'm going to move. And I'm going to step over and sit down or stand up on as a commitment. So the other question is, is what do you need to sit or stand on today? What's the one thing that you're facing today. 
you use the same questions. What's happened in the past? What do you know that's true about God? And what are you going to do on the next step? Are you going to talk about the chair? (laughs) Or are you going to sit in it? That's for us.